so first thing, congratulations on the sublime, the shape of water. Uh, it's beautiful and moving and just... These are very strange things. Mustn't touch them. The feedback no? is oh. very weird. Um, so. so it's an amazing film, and we will get to that in due course. Mm -hmm. um, but first of all, I want to talk to you about monsters. Yes. Um, because you love monsters. Uh, you've said monsters are real for me. Monsters are a religion to me. Um, and you found companionship in sort of monsters. Yes. So can we just sort of start there? I mean, obviously, lots of your films contain monsters. So why and what do you mean by them being a religion? Because you talk about the creature as well, like the it, Holy Spirit. It's true, it's true. I mean, I, um, I, had, I, I was a very lonely child, you know. Um, I was very strange. And when I was a kid from the crib, I... I started, I saw my brother and I stayed late and watched a movie, a program called The Outer Limits, and uh, we shouldn't have stayed late, and it was uh, an episode called The Mutant with Warren Oates. And you were two at the time. It was, it's a house where we lived when, from when I was a baby to age four, and I was sleeping on the crib, so around two. And uh, it's, it's, he appears with giant eyes and a bald head, and I started screaming and I couldn't stop, and my brother, who uh, was a bit of an asshole, uh, <laughs> grabbed me and put me in the crib and zipped me up, zipped it close. And then he had the great uh, idea to, uh, the, the, in, in a magic shop, they used to sell these rubber eggs as a joke. And he put the eggs and he put a, a stocking on his head. So he looked bald and with giant eyes. And he peeked into the crib. And I peed all over the <laughs> crib. And, and I was so scared. And then, from then on, I started having lucid nightmares, which meant I would wake up and dream that I was waking up in the crib, and, but everything was alive in the room. There would be things in the closet, there would be, my parents had this green shaggy rug, and, and it was a sea of fingers waving, waiting for me to go to the bathroom. So I peed in the crib again. <laughs> And my mother got really angry at me. And so one night, I, this is completely true, I got up into the crib and I said to the monsters in the room, if you let me go to the bathroom, I'll be your friend forever. And you know, they let me go to the bathroom. <laughs> I already went, don't worry. <laughs> but but, but um, it's true. And then you know, my, my, my therapist explained to me <laughs> that sometimes when you have a huge fear, you actually revert it into something you like, sort of a macro uh, alliance with, with your worst side, you know, like a Stockholm Syndrome times 10. And, and uh, what happened is, from then on, most of the monsters I saw would not scare me. And the moment, and there was a moment that was very religious for me when uh, Boris Karloff as the creature comes to the threshold in Frankenstein, I, I was moved to tears. I was like, I saw the Messiah. You know, I saw, I was St. Paul on the road to Damascus. I saw a, a Christ-like figure full of suffering and beatitude. You know, his eyes were up, sort of like a saint. Or like in, in Mexico, the, uh, Mexico and Philippines have the goriest uh, Catholic imagery. And, and, they, and for some reason, Jesus has like an exposed bone, fra exposed bone fracture, a, a rib sticking out, but it looks like he's coming. He's like, oh! No, it's like, it's like this weird combination. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like the ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini. You know, it's like, okay. So I, when Karloff came in, his eyes were up, and I was, that's like Jesus. And it started... Uh, a relationship that, where I felt solace and identification. And it was either that or I befriended a nest of ants. <laughs> and I talked to each ant <laughs> in the garden. So pretty sad, you know. But my mind was always racing, imagining things. And, and I started drawing monsters when I was very, very young. My, I spent a long time with my grandmother living there. And uh, she hated that I drew monsters. She thought I was uh, abnormal. <laughs> and th they took me to, um, to a psychologist, and, and he gave me a 
cube of clay and said, sculpt whatever you want, and I sculpted a skeleton that didn't, <laughs> didn't help my case. Uh, <laughs> There is a nice anecdote, but, which I've never told anyone, but it's funny. My mother started reading child psychology and came, uh, came late one night and saw these abnormal drawings in the kitchen. And she said, I'm afraid Guillermo may be severely damaged, she told my father, because these drawings indicate a low intelligence. And my father says, I drew that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> poor dad. So it is real. I think that uh, when I read Mary Shelley's novel, it moved me. It, it, you know, it it made me think of a Miltonian tragedy. Like it truly expressed the questions that are basic to to mankind. Why am I here? You know, the relationship with an uncaring creator. Uh, it really, really moved me. And 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 uh, it was through through those books and those uh, experiences in literature that you end up, you know, if you start with horror, you're gonna wander into Mary Shelley for sure, uh, Edgar Allan Poe for sure, but then you go into Victor Hugo, Oscar Wilde, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, Henry James, and eventually it's the same with art. I started uh, collecting, uh, you know, reading comic books and all that, and my parents bought an encyclopedia of art, and I read the entire encyclopedia, and so I could, I was, talking about Jack Kirby or Bernie Wrightson, and I was thinking about Degas, Manet, Monet, Chirico. I could talk about this when I was seven or eight. And so it's, it's a very strange childhood. I don't, know, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's useful. <laughs> and we have to thank your brother. Yeah, my brother. <laughs> I owe him 10%. <laughs> <laughs> so... You, you mentioned you started reading, you started drawing, you started making Super 8 movies, <laughs> <laughs> you studied at film school, you were a critic, you started yeah. your own festival. Yeah, I was, I was a critic for a few years. Um, I, 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 w there was a cinema club that we, for about five, six years, I would sell the tickets, d design the poster, spool the movie, project the movie, and do the Q&A. <laughs> But what it was great, it was, it was a film education. You know, we had uh, every weekend, we had four movies. You had to program the cycle. So you would have a Max of Holes. You would have William Wyler. You would have to do uh, thematic pairings, you know, an, uh, Canadian animation. And it was a great education in world cinema. And uh, as a critic, you know, I, I tried to, you know, I was in my early 20s, late teens. So I was as... You know, you think you know a lot more, and you you, know, you have more certainty than when you age. So I was a bit of an asshole, you know. And, but but I was I, I wrote a book on Hitchcock at age 23. Uh, it was the collection was 100 page books, and mine was 541. <laughs> you know, and, and but it it really it's a filmmaker where I bonded with him. Uh, we then the cinema club became a school. The school got absorbed by the University of Guadalajara. I taught, I was a, a, a student the first year and a teacher for the next three years. And then we founded, the cinema club became a festival and the festival has been running now for more than 30 years. And it, I'm one of the founders. It's accidental, but uh, it's because I think that uh, we didn't have a festival. We didn't have a school. So we ended up creating that reality and you also taught yourself special makeup effects, and you started your own effects company as a way of kind of preparing for your debut feature. Yeah, well, I could sculpt and I could paint, not not really, really well, but I could. I was self-taught on both, and I applied because I wrote as Dick Smith, uh, the famous makeup artist, and, and I said, look, I, I, I'm a filmmaker. I want to make a movie called Kronos about vampires. I need to make these effects, and no one does them in Mexico. Can I learn? from your course so I can found a company and show the people that I can do this. And he said, okay. And I, I did it for 10 years. We created a really good company that could do stop motion animation, optical effects, uh, makeup effects. And, and then after Kronos, I closed it, you know, because I, it had uh, done its purpose. Yeah. But it took you 10 years, effectively, to make Cronus, and at yeah. one point you had to remortgage your house and sell yes. your car, and yeah. it was a real struggle. Well, it was. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, um, 
by this time, before Kronos, I worked in 21 movies for other people. Uh, uh, I, I did many, many episodes of a TV series called Ora Marcada, which Alfonso Cuaron used to call the toilet zone. Because <laughs> his head is the, like the twilight zone, but shitty. <laughs> I actually was very thankful they gave us the opportunity to practice. And, you know, we would practice one thing in every episode. Like I would say, uh, I'm going to do my whole episode. I'm going to practice the solves. And it was a luxury if you, they gave you a dolly. So I said, I'm going to do the entire episode on a dolly. I'm going to do it in mediums. Alfonso would do different exercises. And I, I co-wrote one of the episodes with him. I played the seven times I played the monster. And one of them was with him. He directed me on an episode we called Directed. We were very, very young. And, uh, and uh, you know, so Kronos was very difficult because, I, first of all, nobody wanted to produce it. Then Berto Navarro, Guillermo Navarro's sister, he, he was my DP. He became my DP. He won the Oscar for Pan's Labyrinth. And uh, I, I came to a movie that uh, maybe no one ever saw, but it's actually very influential. It's, it's called Cabeza de Vaca. It was about an explorer that gets lost in, in Mexico. And we came up with a makeup that was used to create Indian tribes really fast, which was mud with different colors. And then that was taken by Terry Malik on The New World. Lubeski told me, yeah, we were checking that movie, and Terry liked that. And that was taken by Mel Gibson on Apocalypto. <laughs> and it now it, people assume that's the way it was. But what, it, what we did is I had the juice of a plant and some sp hairspray and colored mud, to, because when you have extras as, as uh, Indians, they all had tan marks. And it was really hard to, so I said, well, let's cover them in mud. And the movie is beautiful, aesthetically beautiful. You have blue tribes, yellow tribes. It's really quite powerful. But Berta was producing that movie. And I made up about 125 people every day, me and two assistants. That was it. And, and she was very impressed that I, and then I did the, the, the main star and everybody else, makeup, hair, nails, everything. And she said, you, you really are a hard worker. I go, yes. <laughs> and, and she said, uh, can I read your screenplay? So I showed her Kronos, and she said, I'll produce it. She was one of the most important producers in Mexico. And that's why I produce, produced a D at the end for many years, first time directors. So I wanted to pay it forward. Now I just want to live. <laughs> so so I, I, I'm not doing it as much. But but uh, I did it. and and. We went to the authorities in Mexico, and um, uh, basically I said, I want to make this mi uh, middle-class Mexican vampire story about a grandpa and a granddaughter, and he sucks blood and sleeps in a toy chest. And they, all my life, my pitches have been very unfortunate. <laughs> you know, I want to do a post-war, civil war, fascist, anti-fascist fable. I want to do... Uh, musical thriller drama about a woman that falls in love with an amphibian man. <laughs> you know, and so they didn't want to do it. Normally, what it takes to do a movie through the government support, it would take a year. And it took four years. And they kept sending me back for more. They said, do the storyboards. I did the storyboards. Fabricate the device that appears in the movie. I fabricated the device. Fabricate the insect. I fabricated the insect. And I kept coming. And you know, finally, out of despair, I said to one of the guys, look, if you don't approve it next time, I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> and I said, I'm bigger, and I don't give a shit. <laughs> I have nothing to lose. You know? And he laughed, and I laughed, but <laughs> <laughs> he approved it. <laughs> and then, then what happened is uh, the movie is done, and we, we're very proud of it. It's the movie some of you may have seen. And, uh, and we show it to the Institute of Film. And I wrote it in my diary. It's on one page of my diary, the date. And it says, showed it to the Institute of Mex Mexican Institute of Film. And the reply was, this is a horrible movie. It will never be seen. It will go to no festivals, nor will it ever collect an award. <laughs> and I go, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see a clip from that horrible movie. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and so I said it. Uh, Set it up? Yeah, After? You, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Well, the, the, I wanted the vampire to be a really sad vampire that was, I, I wanted to use it as a metaphor for addiction. So, you know, it's very easy to suck blood from Winona Ryder's neck, but I wanted it to make it apparent that it was not that easy. And I think if we see it complete, it's one shot or two shots, you know, if we see it complete. And I wanted it to style, stylize it so there is no red in the movie, no red, except for an overcoat and the blood at all. It was, the rest of the movie is are directed in black, white, uh, blue, and ambers. So uh, this is the scene where he gets blood for the first time. I, I forgot to say that it's a nosebleed that he sees in the party and follows the guy to the bathroom. <laughs> so it did win an award. It won plenty oh, yeah. of awards. It won a prize at Cannes, won 25 international awards, but yep. still at home they didn't really... No, it was, it was actually when we... They didn't show it to the Cannes Film Festival. They didn't. Uh, they said, we're going to... I said, can we show them my movie? And they said, it was, it was like a fat Cinderella. You know, it was like, oh, can I go to the ball? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to clean. And, 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 and somebody, somebody, a critic uh, from Spain, showed it to the, to the festival. And I, it got selected for the Critics Week. It was, and it won the top prize at Critics Week in Cannes. It was the first time in 30 years a Mexican movie won a prize in Cannes. And, uh, and uh, then it won, you know, nine Academy Awards in Mexico, and it won another 16, 18 uh, uh, prizes all over the world. And then I said, okay, I, I've established that this weird strike of mind could could mean something and I go with Devil's Bag when I they refuse to finance it. You know, they say no. And I said, why? And they said, no. And I go, okay. <laughs> so I waited uh, about seven or eight years to do it. It it it, it was never it was not easy. And it, it was it, it was on the beginning it's not it was not easy. Now it's a little easier. But I have refused to do movies that other people do. <laughs> I just want to do the movies I want to do, and uh, and I think uh, it, it didn't it didn't get um, you know it didn't get shown much in in in, in uh, the sort of hallowed circles in Mexico, but it found an audience. It was it was really uh, quite a, a a bit of a, a recognition in the states in the art circuit, and that led me you know I owed uh, a quarter of a million dollars at age 29. <laughs> And uh, I, I had to pay it. And so uh, somebody called me from Universal, an, an executive called Nina Jacobson, and said, are you interested in writing anything for us? And I go, well, you know, I really just want to make Mexican movies. And they said, well, if you write something for us, we will pay you DGA minimum. I said, how much is that? She said, $40,000. I go, I'll write something. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote a really strange movie for <laughs> called Mephisto's Bridge. Uh, but Eventually, uh, three years after, I, I had paid my debt, you know. Mm. So Mimic was your first American experience, yes. which you sort of fought and lost. I, uh, my first American experience was almost my last experience because it was with the Weinsteins uh, at Miramax. And I can tell you, two horrible things happened in the in late 90s. My father was kidnapped, and I worked with the Weinsteins. It's, <laughs> I, and I don't know which one was worse. Actually, the kidnapping made more sense. <laughs> I, I knew what they wanted, you know? And, uh, and uh, I really hated the experience, but I learned to fight. And uh, two things that happened that were positive on Mimic. I lost casting battles. I lost story battles. I lost many battles, but the one thing Mimic is, and 100% is visually, exactly what I wanted. Our direction, camera moves, uh, color palette, cinematography. And I realized, okay, I learned that. And I learned a lot more. And really, on Mimic, I learned to move the camera in, in a really beautiful choreography with the, act, the actors. Because Bob Weinstein was always saying, why don't you move the camera? You never move the camera. I go, okay, I'm going to move the camera. But I'm going to move the camera the way I want it. And I, I devised this idea of counter movements for the overs, and, and that's the way I should now. Without that experience, I would have not progressed uh, much. 
and, and the movie is visually gorgeous, and it has a couple of sequences I'm very, very proud of, you know? And I remember on, on our first, one of our first meetings, they said, you know, the only rule you gotta follow is you cannot harm kids or pets. So I had one scene where I killed two kids and one dog. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I don't know if this is much of an achievement, but it felt good. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and then the movie, the movie got actually very well reviewed for a giant cockroach movie. <laughs> And, and uh, after that, I had met Pedro Almodovar at the end of the tour of Kronos. And Pedro Almodovar had said to me, I love your movie. If, I, if, um, if you can come to Spain, we will produce something for, me, for you. And I found um, this a screenplay. Uh, a friend of mine did the worst thing you can do to a friend. He gave me five screenplays that he wrote for, to read. And, and I said, okay, this is the end of the friendship. And four of them were dismal, dismal. And the f fifth one had one amazing image, which was a bomb in the middle of a patio in an orphanage. And I said, okay, I can take what I have from Devil's Backbone, and I can combine it with this, and I can co-write it with these guys. And I then, during the kidnapping of my dad, Pedro Almodovar came to Guadalajara, and I met with him and I pitched him Devil's Backbone. And he said, well, look, it sounds like three movies, really. But I said, no, 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 it's a single movie. It really is. It's, it's a gothic Western horror ghost story set in the end of the Civil War. It's OK, you, you can try it. And he, he is really, the, along with Berta, the best producer uh, for, for somebody starting. He was incredibly gentle, incredibly respectful. And he basically resurrected me. He allowed me to believe that you could make movies again. And again, when I produce uh, Bayona or I produce Andy Muschietti with Mama, I protect them because of that. I really, I'm, or Jorge in Book of Life, I try to protect them very well. I try to shield them from the studio. And they have a very good creative experience because I owe it to life. You know, uh, Almodovar did it for me. And uh, I said, in many ways, Devil's Backbone is my first movie because I knew how to do things, technically more complex and narratively uh, also quirky and strange. And it's, uh, my favorite movies I've done are Shape of Water, Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, Crimson Peak, Hellboy 2, and Pacific Rim. The rest I can give or take. But, but <laughs> those are, I love. I love. And, uh, uh, it, it kind of gave me a second chance at life. Cool. Uh, we're going to skip over Blade 2, which okay. I think you sort of did so you could do Hellboy. And no, I, I actually, I, I met with Wesley. It was very peculiar because I said, I met with Wesley and I said, look, I, I needed to prove that I could do a big movie because there were still rumors about Mimic. Can he do action? Is he okay with a bigger, more complex movie? And, uh, you know, back then, the Weinsteins had uh, publicly sort of a hallowed aura of patrons of the arts, like the Borgias, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you don't want to dine with Lucretia, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and, and then, uh, so nobody knew, is it him, is it? So I said, this will prove that I can do Hellboy 1, you know? And uh, I went and I met with Wesley and I said, look, I read the screenplay, I don't understand Blade. <laughs> I'm the most unhip guy on earth, but if you take care of Blade, I'll take care of the vampires. And I wanted to do this vampire that appears in the movie. And Wesley said, can you shoot me out in three shots or four shots every day? I go, yeah, I can. I treated him like a makeup effect because I want to go home early. I go, that's cool. <laughs> said, and I don't do overs, that's cool. And I don't do mediums, that's cool. I only do close-ups, and I said, that's fine. And it was a lot of fun to make that movie. I invited Ron Perlman, and we had a blast. <laughs> so after that, um, apparently you were creatively at something of a kind of crossroads. Yeah. Hollywood was offering you kind of big movies at that point, yeah. and you turned them down because you'd rather do this sort of anti-fairy tale fairy tale. Oh, Pan's Labyrinth, yeah. Well, yes, I did Hellboy, and then... Uh, uh, I got offered every superhero on the face of the earth and uh, other other movies, uh, 
very, very big movies, and I, I really wanted to, I felt that I learned a lot uh, technically, and I felt that I could do a complicated movie, but I felt I needed to do, it was exactly the same impulse that happened to me to do Shape of Water, but I felt I, need, I needed to do something very, very, very strange. Because Hellboy did well, Blade did well, and I, you know, I used to say to Alfonso, every time the movies do well, even if they don't do extraordinarily, they do enough. Blade did super well, and I said, we eat the cereal of shit, but we get the toy at the bottom of the box. We should go and do something really, really, that you cannot do in in low times. So I went and started pitching Pan's Labyrinth. I pitched it everywhere. Nobody wanted to do it. Nobody wanted to do it. And uh, somebody said, we'll do it if you do it in English. And I said, I'm not going to do it in English. I'm not, it's because then you end up with the Euro co-production with Rutger Hauer as an Argentinian bully <laughs> or some <coughs> shit like that. And, and I didn't want to do it. And I said, I got to do it in Spanish. But um, So Telecinco in Spain decided to finance it. And uh, it was, along with Mimic and along with Shape of Water, one of the hardest, most ungrateful shoots in my life. Incredibly difficult, horribly difficult. But, and it was, uh, I was 42, and uh, when we were shooting, the crew, most of the crew, thought I was insane, because a, a phone would walk into the set in a, in a fascist headquarters, and they would go, <laughs> You know, and, and then the fun would talk to the girl. It was just, what is this movie? You know, and uh, the moment I think where they went, oh, this is something, is the moment we're gonna see, because I had, I fought with even my close collaborators, DDT, the makeup effects company. The 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 makeup of the paleman that you're gonna see, it was supposed to be an old man that lost a lot of weight, and it's so perverse that he has a table full of food, and he only eats children. So he uses the table to attract innocence and devour it. And they did the most beautiful sculpture of an old man's face, incredibly detailed. And I said to them, remove the face. Take, let's make it flat like a manta ray's belly. Uh, and then we'll put the eyes in the hands. And they hated my gods. They said, the sculpture is beautiful. I said, I don't care. It needs to have no face. because." You know, to me, it represented the type of power that devours innocence. You know, and I said it shouldn't have a face; it shouldn't be a specific person. You know, and 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 uh, we fought and we fought and we fought. We had fought a little on Devil's Backbone because I had told them to do the ghost like a broken porcelain doll, and they said that makes no sense. I said it makes sense to me because it's innocence broken, like a porcelain doll or a cracked egg. It, it tells you he's a fragile creature. And I think that needs to, there's verisimilitude, and then, then there's the reality of the tale. And I said, that's where it needs to make sense. I don't care about the real world. So the moment the crew, the whole crew gasped, was the moment Doc Jones does this and opens his arm. And it got a little better after that. Um, <laughs> let's talk about Doug. Jones, yeah. who is inside that makeup, yes. and you've yeah. worked with him on Hellboy, Hellboy 2. I actually started working with him on Mimic, 1997. He's uh, one of the giant cockroach guys. <laughs> and I met him, and, I, and he was so thin, and I was so envious. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, he was really, really good. It was a very simple shot where the creature looks over the roof, but it, we tried with two, three people. They didn't work. And then I said to him, you need to lean like, like a top limb building. It needs to be straight. And he did it in one move. And, I, and then we shot a trailer for the movie using him. And I kept, he, he had the silliest business card in the world with, a, with a, like, a, like a cartoon made by those cartoonists at the beach. Okay. Where they <laughs> draw your head with, in a little car. It was like that. <laughs> it was so horrible that I kept it. You know? And then uh, years later on Hellboy, we had sculpted Abe Sapien already once over a Japanese or Chinese acrobat. And it was short and it was stocky and it didn't look good. And then uh, Michael Isalda said, 
well, there's a guy called Doug Jones. I said, I know him. He's the super thin guy. And we, I called him, and I, we re-sculpted Abe Sabian for him. And we rediscovered each other. And I mean, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal actor. He's not a performer. He's an actor. And, and he was so absolutely great. And when we did this, uh, I said to him, look, I've been, uh, for Pants, I studied uh, every fairy tale book. I had read all as a kid, but then I started studying Victorian fairy uh, manuals. That, a lot of Victorian literature on fairies is taken as serious, seriously as anthropology. There's a book, for example, called British Goblins. There's one called The Science of Fairy Tales. There is hundreds uh, of texts that are done completely seriously about the lore in the northern lands. And I studied everything. I studied, obviously, Tatar and uh, Popov and you know Bruno Bettelheim and all that. But I started classifying. I said, you're going to have to play an ogre, which is this character, and you're going to have to play the fun. And he said, you're trying to save money? I said, no. No, it's actually the plot is that these tests are the fun in disguise. He's testing the girl. The, the fairies that he eats come back at the end, so you know they're not real. He didn't really eat them. He was testing her to see if she could be obedient or disobedient in the right circumstances. And uh, he said, OK, I'll do it. And what about the fun? I said, well, you have to do it in Spanish. And so he learned all the lines phonetically to, to, to play the fun. And uh, that, the, the suits were torture. I came up with a new way of doing the legs for the fun, which has never been done before. Now people do it. But it was to project the legs backwards from the knees mm -hmm. and then erase the front of the actor's leg digitally. You know, And it, it, it was a very tortuous process. Sometimes this makeup would take seven hours, eight hours to apply and many hours to take. So a dog would sleep in the makeup uh, and come back the next morning just to be retouched. But he's a hero. And he's a great friend, and he's a really good actor. And of course, he's in The Shape of Water. Shape of Water, he's, uh, we did Hellboy 2, uh, we did Crimson Peak, and we did Shape of Water. You know, I think that um, uh, we'll get to the shape on time, but I needed an actor. And I think Doug is one of the few guys that can do this. Uh, makeup effect, makeup, uh, a lot of great actors can wear it, and it doesn't work with them. You know, it's a discipline. It's uh, in theater. There is the thing called mask work, you know. But you need. To, it's like getting into a new car. You need to calibrate how you control the car. You know, it's uh, they need to calibrate it, and, and and it takes hours for an actor to even master this looking good and the thickness of the makeup. Uh, be, because I did it for ten years, I really think it helped me into creating truly great monsters uh, that take risks uh, digitally and like the barrier of digital and, and, and makeup was beautifully crossed I think in Blade 2 when the Reapers opened the mouth that was one of the first times that was done where we took over in the middle of a shot from makeup to digital and with Dog I can have the precision that is required to take over in digital and it looks beautiful Well let's see another uh, makeup with Doug in, which is the Angel of Death from Hellboy 2. Yeah, which is the worst makeup I've inflicted upon him. The the Angel of Death, uh, we I wanted to do the wings mechanically. I didn't want to make digital wings. So it took a long time to figure out the, the servo mechanisms uh, sequencer to have the eyes blink on the wings. And uh, this it was basically as heavy as a motorcycle, the, 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 the rig. And uh, we tried different materials. And uh, you know, we tried to use real feathers, too heavy. Then we tried to vacuum form feathers, you know, too heavy. What ended up being was a super thin wire with the cutout feather from a trash, black trash bag. They were all trash bags. And then we would laminate them. And with a hair dryer, we would sculpt them like feathers. So they weighed nothing. They weighed less than a feather, you know? And still, when you put all the thing together, it was like putting a motorcycle on his back. <laughs> and it dug in. And I said one day he was like always blind. 
you know, and, and he has been there for hours, and the wings were on him. I said, are you okay, dog? And he says, I'm bleeding, but I'm okay. <laughs> and sure enough, he had two lines of blood on his back. So after that, I, we had to devise a really incredibly complex hoisting mechanism that came out of the set and lifted him with the wings. And, uh, and then, but I needed to be graceful. It took a long, long time to solve this little gag. Uh, so what you're gonna see, I'm very proud to say, is 100% real. Extraordinary. So there were five years between the end of that movie and the next film. You yeah, made, yeah. Uh, in which you kind of worked on The Hobbit for two years, you worked I moved on to New Zealand for two years to yeah. work on The Hobbit, and uh, I worked a year and a half on uh, The Mountains of Madness, uh, and uh, we were scouting in a helicopter in Alaska, close to the North Pole. Uh, I was scouting for to shoot uh, The Mountains of Madness in a real, brutal environment, and uh, I forgot there was a more brutal environment, which is the studio system. <laughs> and I, I got a call, they said, we were opening offices that Monday, it was a Friday, and I land in a little cabin in the middle of nowhere, in the border with the North Pole almost, and they said, you should call the studio. And I go, bad news. I knew, I knew, I didn't need to make the phone call, but I did, and they said, we're pulling the plug, we're not making the movie. And by, by then we were scouted, designed, storyboarded, we had beautiful sculptures, we had made a great presentation, we had Jim Cameron producer, Tom Cruise starting. It was, I thought it was, we were gonna make it. And you know, so that alone is three and a half years. And uh, then I, I, I went and did uh, Pacific Rim. Is it fair to say that that was a way of kind of exercising your frustrations, big robots beating the crap out well, of Well, it is, it is uh, for sure, but it is something that was, uh, to me the important thing is with the, the, the metaphor for me was, I wanted to make the movie because of the character of Mako Mori. You know, I, I love the idea of a scared girl that lost her parents and has one red shoe in her hand living inside the adult and the adult being inside the robot and you still have to conquer that fear you know no matter you can be 25 stories high and you have to trust the guy next to you and the guy next to you has to trust you to survive that was very attractive to me you know and then i thought you know i grew up with kaijus and ultraman and i grew up basically like my my childhood programming on tv was exactly the same as a kid would have in Tokyo. Uh, it was Osamu Tezuka, uh, Ultraman, Ultra Seven, uh, you know, um, Tetsujin, uh, everything, uh, Doraemon, you know? So um, I wanted to do a proper kaiju movie with a proper mecha fighting it, and I had a blast. I loved that movie so much, and it was visually such a banquet. I wanted to make it uh, visually sumptuous, um, elegant, uh, with the crassest 80s dialogue I could, <laughs> you know. But you know, I, I, I had a blast with that. But then, uh, basically, what happened with that movie is there was a, uh, the, the release was selling it very much like Transformers. It was selling it not showing the creatures, not showing that they clashed against them, blah, blah, blah. But it was, it was in making, it was a great experience. So another film that was sort of missold is Crimson Peak. Yeah. Uh, which, again, is another beautiful, elegant movie. So we're going to see a clip from Crimson Peak. So, so let me set it up. It's, you know, it was sold as a horror Halloween movie. It was a very strange gothic romance. You know, it was completely a different genre. I tried to influence the, the campaign and have them sell it like, like what it was, but it wasn't. And that's the uh, one lesson I learned. Um, uh, we'll talk about it on The Shape of Water. But uh, again, I think is the most beautiful movie I've done, very close to my heart. Uh, is a depuration of the camera work, set design, wardrobe design, being completely in unit and gorgeously mounted. And uh, the scene we're gonna see is Edith, which is called Edith for Edith Wharton, uh, you know, spending her first night 
at the at the Sharps house and uh, encountering her first, uh, actually her second mm. ghost. So we should see. Can, can we talk about what you call eye protein and not eye candy and the whole kind of visual storytelling yeah. and, and the, yeah, sure. the costumes I mean, and camera? Well, and there, there's little things that you may or may not notice. By the way, the ghost, uh, some people say, oh, they're, they're digital. They're not. They're real. It's, it's Doc Jones and the makeup. The translucency of the bones is digital, but it's their, their physical makeup complete head to toe. And uh, uh, the reason the ghost is red uh, the, again, the color red is used only for sin, regret, and the past in the movie. And they're all linked by the color red. Uh, America was color-coded in gold, and the old world is color-coded in cyans and greens, and uh, sort of aquamarines and all that. It's a very cold. Uh, and then little details that you don't see, but they're there. The chair where she's sitting, we established it in the first act, and then that chair is three times bigger than the first time you saw it, so she looks tiny. And uh, if you see it again, the the teacup is this fucking size, <laughs> you know? But with the angle of the lens, you don't notice until it's in her hands, and then she looks like a kid with a giant teacup, you know? Uh, and those are little storytelling devices that are invisible, but they, they, they serve uh, to, to work a little bit into, into the visuals being more than just uh, beautiful. The, 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 the hallway is shaped like a, like a human shape with shoulders and head. So even when the corridor is empty, it looks like somebody's there. Uh, the, uh, the, the wallpaper is shaped like uh, moths. The entire movie is the motif of moths and butterflies. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I just try to layer the storytelling uh, with the visual cues and not make it just beautiful, but a device. I read somewhere that um, Sergio Lopez is in uh, Pan's Labyrinth. You made him wear shoes and gloves that made him creak. Yeah. When he, uh, when he moves, I wanted him. I tried to define the characters by sound, if I can. Like uh, Lucille is her keys. You hear ch -ch -ch and silk when she moves. And Sergi, I gave him these super tight gloves and super tight bo boots so that when he moved, he creaked, you know? Like, make him really dry and rigid, you know? So he would, he would sound like, like he was very tense, you know, and, uh, and tight. And I think, uh, you know, you, you use all those resources. I think that it's nice to point them out in audio commentaries and all that for, because I, I believe that people that, are, that don't have the money for film school, that cannot do it, live very far, whatever, audio commentaries for a long time, they were a substitute. At me, I used to listen to laser discs and listen to the audio commentary, and it was like a film school, and it was great, and I tried to do it. The first movie where I refused to do it is Shape of Water, because I, I thought, you know, it's the first movie where I'm 100% happy, first time in my life. And I said, either the movie works or it doesn't. I'm not going to tell anyone why it should work, <laughs> you know? And I think uh, that, that is, um, for me, very important is uh, the movie breathes. Uh, I think that there's a lot of what I, I did. The first nine movies I made uh, were permeated by a sense of loss and a sadness and a nostalgia. And The Shape of Water is the first movie that I do that is hungry for life, and it's life-affirming. And I go back to the comedy that I did a little bit on Kronos, you know, uh, more of a sense of humor, and it's, it's, uh, it's almost like I spend nine movies inhaling, and it's the first time I exhale, you know? Well, it's a perfect time to show a clip from The Shape of Water. Do you want to set it up? Or, or yeah, sure. It's a very reasonable premise. <laughs> there's a, there's a, you know, I, I, I've had... Uh, you know, this is a super secret government facility, uh, and she is the cleaning woman. You know, she cleans the toilets, the floors, the empties the trash bins, and uh, she discovers this amphibian creature, and she recognizes something in him that is love. You know, and uh, we can talk about it after. But and then she decides to try and communicate with him. 
she's mute, and she decides to try and communicate with him. And uh, this is the first time they established that rapport. Sally is extraordinary. We'll talk about her in a minute. Um, the seed of the movie, I think, dates back to when you were six years old and you watched Creature from the Black Goon for the first time and you fell in love with both Judy Adams and the creature yeah. and you wished they'd got off together. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I was a kid and I didn't know better and I thought, oh, gee, I hope they end up together. And, you know, and they didn't. And I, 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 I thought it was a completely unfair movie because it's basically a home invasion. You know, you have this creature living peacefully in his river, and these assholes come in in a boat, invade his house, and kill him. And you go, what? <laughs> this poor bastard was in his slippers having a good time at home, and these guys come in and, hey, we want to study you. Hey, I don't want to be studied. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, and, and I thought uh, I would rectify that, you know, and I thought uh, all I knew is I wanted to make the straight guy with the gun and the nice suit and the square jaw the villain. And I wanted to have the moment where the creature carries uh, the girl, a moment of not a horror movie, but a beautiful uh, moment of love. And that, that's what sustained me, you know? And, um, and uh, you know, I, I felt uh, I needed to find a way to make it be about something that used that, and then little by little, I, the first thing I found was the idea of water being love. You know, because water, love like water has no shape. And it can take the shape of whatever you pour it into. You can fall in love with somebody that is twice your age, same gender, uh, completely opposite religion, a completely wrong political persuasion, it just happens. And, and it, it is like water, the most powerful and malleable element in the universe. And it goes through everything. And I, I, felt, I felt this was perfectly related to the creature. And then in 2011, I uh, was having breakfast with Daniel Krause, who I was doing Troll Hunters with. And he, I said, what, what, are you, what else are you working on? And he said, well, I have this idea about a janitor that falls uh, for a creature in a super, government, super secret government facility and takes him home. And I thought, that's it. I said, I'll buy that idea, and I'll write the screenplay. And it's my next movie. And you know, it, like Devil's Backbone, like Pan's Labyrinth, like this, there was a complete certainty on my part that everything would work. That doesn't happen on the others. There's not, it, this, those three movies and Kronos, there was complete certainty. Like I had an unwavering belief. Then it wavers at the end after you go through hell, but you have the certainty, this is my, I must make this movie. And it's not ego, and you don't want it to be liked, you don't want it to be accepted, you just need to make it. And it's a very different sensation than, than the other times where you go, oh, I want to see this sequence or that sequence, but no, this is a complete, almost uh, like you're listening to a song, and it comes to you complete at once, you know? And you needed the, the various cast members because you wrote the script for yeah. Sally. You wrote it for I saw Sally Hawkins on a BBC series called Fingersmith, which was remarkable. And she fell in love with a woman uh, in the series in Victorian times. And I loved it because the fact that they loved each other and they were the same gender was just a fact. It was not the point of the series. It was just a fact. And I thought, this is so beautiful, you know? It's like the creature and her um, uh, make love physically, but that's not the point of the movie. It's just a fact. And I thought, that, that's really beautiful. I'm gonna, and then I saw her in Submarine and Happy Go Lucky, and I thought she had the most extraordinary beauty. You know, Not Revlon commercial beauty, but true beauty, like a luminosity and a, and a power, but at the same time, you could see her in a, in a bus. You know, she was a normal person, just abnormally beautiful in, in a way that was not standard. And I, I, I said, I'm going to write for her. And I, I called uh, about three or four years before the movie was made. I called her agent and I said, tell her I'm writing a movie for her. 
I says, oh, she says, okay. I go, all right. <laughs> and then I, I didn't see her or talk to her. And uh, one night, I don't go to parties in Hollywood. I hate them because it's like uh, they're not even parties. It's everybody you avoided during the year <laughs> <laughs> together in one place, you know? And, uh, and, and, but Alfonso, Alfonso calls me and says, Alejandro and I are going to the Golden Globes party. And I go, okay. I'm watching Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd rather stay. He says, look, get dressed, you fat fuck. <laughs> get dressed, come on. I said, look, he says, we're going to get shit-faced. I go, I hate drinking. And he says, and, and, and we want to do it with you. I go, look, if I'm going to drink, I don't, I'm not gonna, he says, I'll send a car for you. Uh, I said, okay. So he sends a car for me. Now, I'm big, I'm over 300 pounds. It's a huge amount of mass. It takes a lot of alcohol to get me drunk. <laughs> and it goes away real fast. Like, I can be drunk, with it, and 10 minutes later, I'm like, I can put together a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> and so I arrive and I say, okay, are we gonna get shit faced? They say, yeah, 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 we're gonna get shit faced. Okay, great. So I go, I'm gonna start, and I'll catch up with you. And I have 14 shots of tequila. <laughs> I, I hate this. I hate the flavor of alcohol. It burns my tongue. I like chocolate malt. I like Bailey's. I'm like a <laughs> uh, the most inoffensive drinker. You know, I want. I like a white Russian, something with milk. So I, I drink. I drink the 14 shots, and I go. Okay, now we can start. I go on and say, Alejandro. Uh, uh, okay, we're ready. He says. Oh, no, you know what? We're not going to drink. <laughs> what? So I'm, I said, I'm going to leave. So I'm leaving with my 14 shots of tequila in me. And I see Sally. And I go, hey! And she goes, I go, I'm writing a movie for you where you fall in love with a fish. <laughs> and she says, great. But, but uh, I think I wrote it for Sally, I wrote it for Michael Shannon, I wrote it for Octavia. And very often when Sally, Sally was extraordinary, an extraordinary actress, I said to her, look, I want to do a Beauty and the Beast where, the, where beauty is not a Disney princess, where she makes breakfast, shines her shoes, and masturbates, and, and the Beast doesn't turn into a fucking prince. You know, because I, I think love is about loving who the other person is exactly. If, if you need change, go away. Please go away. You know, don't waste anybody's time. And I thought it could be about embracing and loving the otherness, which my entire career has been about. But I could finally phrase it in a way that I felt was magical, for lack of a better uh, term. It was, uh, and I explained all this to her, and she said, you know, I'm writing a story right now for me, for myself, about a woman that turns into a fish. And I didn't know anything about your project. And we exchanged uh, documents, and I incorporated some of her ideas. And we worked over the course of the pre-production early, early, months and months, if not years, into shaping uh, whatever was needed for her. And many times on the set, when she faltered, when she doubted, I said to her, I wrote a song for you. This is the song. This is your voice. You cannot do anything wrong. All of this, all this world, all this wardrobe, all these sets are done for you. So enjoy it. Don't think. And, and it was an extraordinary experience with the actors. You know, I had a communion with them that was quite unique, you know. And uh, one of the reasons why I love it is because Oftentimes in the other movies, in all the nine movies, there is one part. It can be a postmaster, it can be a policeman that is a horrible actor. That I make the mistake of casting him quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This movie, the smallest part was to my satisfaction. So everything, everything went horribly wrong, but everything went horribly right. You know, and, and, and it's, it made, it's made a difference. Well, look, uh, to me, uh, it's a strange profession we chose as directors because it's a combination of being tough as nails and being as permeable and fragile as you can. And you need to sort of separate the two. 
You cannot be completely fragile because then you won't make movies. You could just become a poet or a painter, you know? Because a filmmaker is never going to die and they're going to find a drawer full of movies that he never did. And oh my God, and it's going to be on DVD and Blu ray. It won't be. <laughs> you know? You have to be a tough motherfucker to get into the business side and fight and tell the bastards, no, no. And I'm no, I won't do it. I'll do it my way. Oh, a lot of fights. So you have to be tough in that. And you have to fight and, and be able to defend what the movie needs to be defended. And then at the same time, you need to be incredibly, incredibly permeable and fragile. And for example, you can be screaming at your producer <laughs> Uh, one moment about the crane not being ready, and then you have to be completely open with your actor to watch the actor perform. You cannot, so it's very, very strange. And that goes for the childlike imagination. You have to preserve that. And uh, yes, it can get really bad, but I think that's the one thing that um, that experience gives you. I've been doing this for 25 years now. And uh, you know, after year 20, you go into the set and there is a certain thing that clicks and allows you, but you're always mortally afraid. Mortally afraid because everybody thinks the director is purely, an, uh, everybody thinks the directing is an exercise of control. And that's a myth that we enthrone because of course the great legend is Eric von Stoheim did 120 takes, uh, Orson Welles knew everything, blah, blah, blah. But I can tell you in reality, the directing, no matter who you are, is the art of orchestrating uh, accidents. You know? Because of course you prepare. Of course I color code and design the movie to a T. Of course all that happens. But every day you're going to get 30 curveballs. The sun is setting, the actor twists his ankle the car crashed, whatever it is, and you cannot say, oh, well, because the day cost between twenty-five to $125,000. If it's a $125,000 day, each moment of hesitation is $10,000, you know? So you cannot stop. And, and, uh, and, and you need to take what is there and make it work, you know? Uh, and and uh, and I think uh, that part then is combined with the fact that as a childlike imagination, you need to be open to see what is right about it. You know, let me put it another way: if an actor acts and you have a, only one idea of how the scene should be, the actor is going to come with great colors. He's going to put them on the table, and you're not going to see any of those colors. You're just going to see red, because that's what you wanted. And maybe green is better. You can say to the actor, try this other way, and if it's the right way, and it's your way, you insist. But you have to be open, and the same is true of every accident you may encounter. You know, uh, 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 how many of you have seen Devil's Backbone? Okay, great, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. No wonder you're here. <laughs> uh, the, the ending of Devil's Backbone was the worst day of the shoot. We had like 50 setups to make, one day, there was no more time. The sun was setting in, in, we had done the stabbing of Conchita, the arrival of the car, major, major scenes, all in the same day, inserts. And I had to do the ending. Nothing, no more, no less than the ending of the movie. And the, origin, the way it was written is, the kids going to the desert, the, the silhouette of Casares comes, he's translucent. The, the professor, they, uh, Carlos, the main protagonist, turns around, looks at him, he looks at Carlos, he nods, disappears, the kids sigh and walk into the desert. And I do the first shot, and we're out of time, we're out of time, and the first shot is so beautiful that I said, that's the ending. But you need to identify, it. that's the ending. And my DP and my producer, well, let's shoot the rest. I go, I, we don't need to shoot the rest. Let's move to something else. And, and that's the ending. So you identify, if I had in my head that it has to be all those shots, I wouldn't have seen that shot for what it was, which is a blessing. So you need to be like that. And, and then uh, you do need to never lose your hope. It's an evolutionary business. Uh, in other words, it's going to be brutal. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be merciless. And if you break, you shouldn't be making movies. You know, 
it's the end of it. You, you need that combination of resilience and fragility. So, you know, it's, you, you have to have it. All of, all of them have them. All of them are some form of autobiography. Pacific Rim, even Blade Two. I mean, seriously, like Nomak and his father, uh, that relationship is very much the way I felt about my dad, the poor man, you know? And, but I always, I, 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 would, I have never made a movie that I wouldn't die for, you know? And, and I, it doesn't matter if it's commercial or people think it's commercial. I've said no to incredibly lucrative things, you know, incredibly lucrative. Like my agent must be very unhappy with me <laughs> because I go, no, I'm going to do this other movie. Okay. Uh, uh, but but uh, all of them are biography. All, all art is portraiture. All art is portraiture. And n n all art is political. Those are things that you can't avoid. And you will know a person, like, for their art, if it's true, more than you would know probably from living together for 10 years, you know? But I guess in high school, uh, uh, you know, I said, I'll always look this good, <laughs> which I have to <coughs> yeah. maintain, you know? But, but it was such a moving moment for me when he says, I wish I could do something about this, you know? We can't, you know, but I think I've been trying to solve what love is most of my life, you know, and that's why it's so satisfying for me, The Shape of Water, because it's the first time I've been able to articulate it, you know, because I think the, the greatest act of love, like cinema, is to see, you know, when somebody sees you in your entirety for who you are, that's the greatest act of love, because is granting you existence beyond what defines you in the exterior or your nationality or whatever it is. When they see you with love and compassion and beauty is the greatest act of love. And that's why the line in, in Shape of Water is, is when he sees me, you know, every time he sees me, he doesn't know I'm incomplete because that's the essence of it, you know? And, and, and uh, uh, it's exactly like cinema. I think film is an act of love. It's the, the desire to apprehend the world, you know? And I think fantasy is infinitely more realistic than realism. Because like Borges said, if I wrote a poem in which the world was contained, that poem would be the world. And that's an impossible task. So it is the only way you can trap the world is through parable, you know? It's parable allows you to apprehend the larger concepts and discuss them. And you can make a creature without face power. You can make a creature that lives in the water the outsider, the other, you know? You can, and then you can go on and on and on. That's why parable is used to explain the deeper concepts, all the way to the Greeks, you know? But yeah, everything is autobiography, chronos, the relationship between the girl and the grandfather is very based on my relationship with my grandmother. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, uh, she would pull out a little uh, uh, mattress from the closet, put it at the at the foot of the bed, and we would talk into the night, and I would fall asleep. You know, and, and basically, I would say, I would love to do secret passages <laughs> in the house, and we could do them this way and that way. That's a great idea. We should budget it tomorrow, you know? <laughs> I go, yeah. And then we can have a sliding bookshelf, Grandma, and she says, that's a great idea. Or a portrait, and we move the portrait, and we go into a secret room, yes. And that's the house I have now. I have, I have my man cave is two houses, 13 libraries interconnected with secret passages, uh, secret paintings and a room where it rains 24/7, you know, and 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 I, I think that uh, I think that that's my attempt at a cabinet of curiosities that encompasses the world, but my movies are all cabinets of curiosities, of who I am. My I used to talk to ants, I used to love insects. I wanted to be a a naturalist, a biologist, a, an entomologist. So you know. Everything you see is portraiture, you know? I, I am that weird. <laughs> First of all, 
my deepest admiration and sympathy for what you chose as a profession <laughs> is, is brutal. It's absolutely merciless. And the worst part, the grinder of it all is auditions. So the first thing you need to say to yourself is what I say when a movie I spend a year and a half preparing falls, falls through. Uh, I tell my designers, it was good practice, you know? So every time you go into an audition, come in with something you want out of it. And it shouldn't, feel, it shouldn't be the job. That's, I know, weird, but success is a fucking mirage doesn't exist. And, and no matter, if you need success, you'll never have enough. So you, you do, is what we did with the episodes, Alfonso and I, let's practice a dolly. Let's use it, with, let's shoot it with long lenses. Those are perfectly achievable goals. So whenever you're preparing for a part, read the part and say, I'm gonna try this. Because then, the, then you're in control. You go, you know, if you go in, it's a mid-market. You're parading yourself like a beauty pageant of acting, and you have assholes that have been there all day with Doritos and a Coke, <laughs> you know, saying to you, thank you, and then you come out destroyed from that. But if you go in to try something, these assholes are your audience. And you go in, and you try what you want, and you go, that was good. And they go, thank you, and you go, thank you, and you leave. <laughs> so that's, that's number one. Thank you. Uh, because then, then you're in control, okay? Then second, what I do for my actors, and some of them take them, some of them don't, and I do it for my screenwriting process, I write incredibly detailed biographies. You can find them... Um, on the Crimson Peak book. You can find them on the Shape of Water book. I, if you follow me on Twitter, I posted them. You know, I, I tell them everything I know about the character. Everything. What they eat, what they don't eat, what music they listen, what secrets they keep. You know, and I tell them from birth to the moment of the movie. And you build that for a project and you then are open to listening. You know, then you're open to listening, but you have a fallback. Because a lot of the time, directors are mortally afraid of actors. You know, they're horrified to talk to the actors. And they can only say faster, shorter, blah, blah, blah. And there's a reason to. When you're acting, uh, you know, like I'm talking right now. I didn't know these lines. I didn't know I was going to be saying this to you. Right now, my right leg has gone to sleep, you know? <laughs> and these pants are too fucking tight. <laughs> That's, that's my reality. So to an actor, you give an actor a verb, something to do. And as an actor, you need to know the verb you want to enact. If nobody, nobody gives it to you. I always talk about a scene, uh, I think it's in Diner or the Pope of Greenwich Village, in which Mickey Rourke is talking on a diner, and he opens a sugar and empties the sugar, and then puts all the sugar back into the container while he's delivering a big dialogue. Because he was not delivering dialogue. He was playing with the sugar. So always come in with a little play playground for yourself. And then if somebody gives you another idea, namely the director, then you can take it or, or not, you know? Thank you. No, it, it, it is. I mean, look, what we do is not very important. I mean, the entire canon of Shakespeare didn't change the fucking world. It didn't. It just maybe made it a more palatable place to be because you can read it or see it in the theater, but it didn't change. The, we still have horrible politicians. We still have corruption, destruction, abuse, you know? So you have to really think, look, art is just a nice thing to stay alive, you know? And then you say, what can I do that is not being done? I would, I would say I try to be a humanist in the movies, and it doesn't matter if it's Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim, when I took Pacific Rim, I made my conditions known. I said, I'm not going to subscribe to any army of any country. I don't want one country saving the world. I don't want it. I want it to be a, a black leader, a Japanese girl, a, a, a pair of Australians, a, a, a Peruvian technician. You know, I said, I don't want one race to save the world. 
I don't want this, I don't want that. It's not what I want, it's what I don't want. You know, and I, I'm a big admirer of the 30s and the 40s, and when film was starting, some of the greatest parts were written for John Crawford, they were written for Betty Davis, they were Sylvia Sidney, you know, these were fantastic actresses, complex women, especially pre-code. You know, when you see a movie like Three on a Match, three really complex characters, John Blondell, blah, 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 fantastic parts. And that's not done anymore. And I'm just, I think that there is so much more nuance. I mean, I, I would never, never say I'm feminist because that's gender misappropriation. I find it really obscene when a guy says, I'm a feminist filmmaker, really? How do you know? I mean, you can guess, you can guess, but you can know what it feels. I mean, you, you can, as a dramaturgy exercise, attempt, but I attempt the same with the bad guy, the good guy. The, I try to write them from the way I kind of understand it, but I try to make them human and complex. And that's why I think the great relief for me on Shape of Water is to open with a masturbating scene. You know, because, okay, she's not a Disney princess, as I said, but also is the one practice everybody's good at <laughs> and has had experience with, you know? It's the one sexual practice where you go, yeah, yeah, that was good. You know, <laughs> most everybody can. And, and we are, you know, we're afraid of those dimensions, you know? And when I wrote Crimson Peak, I wanted a beautiful uh, pair of roles, but not perfect. Not perfect. Lucille is not perfect, but it's a great role. It's a great role. And, and Edith is not perfect, but it's a great role. You know, I think that in writing a female part is like having a relationship with, 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 with a, um, a female companion. You, the worst things you can do is uh, put them in the cellar and demonize them, or put them on a fucking pedestal. Because both are incredibly isolating and impossible to fulfill. You know, if you put someone in a pedestal, you're putting that person there to, to tumble them. It's gonna tumble, because nobody deserves to be perfect. I always say, and that's why I love monsters, that perfect, imperfection is a perfectly attainable goal for all of us. And, and if we go into writing imperfect characters that have huge flaws, but we can love them for that, you know, it, there's a line on Hellboy, we like people for their qualities, but we love them for their defects, you know? So I, I, I'm very interested in writing good parts that are human, humanistic parts, and the more, to me, how many of you saw Shape of Water? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, no wonder you're here then, <laughs> second time. Uh, one of the great moments for me is the moment where Sally just looks at, at uh, Michael Shannon when he comes to her, and she just looks at him like, and there's such a fuck you in there. <laughs> and it's, it's written very terse, and you need a great actress to deliver that, because she really doesn't care about him. And I love those moments, because the uh, writing, writing for a, a great actress, and I think that the world, you know, everybody's talking about scandals and power abuse. It's not limited to film. It's, the world is a fucking rigged game. And it's been rigged for millennia. So, you know, I just, I just try to find interesting people with interesting lives that, that clean toilets, but can also be incredibly good enemies to a guy like Strickland, you know? Because that, that's what I want to do. I want to see the kids in Devil's Vagabond kill the fascist. You know, I want to see the girl uh, have a much better ending than the fascist captain. I want it, those are the things because the world most of the time doesn't work like that. So I think we should aspire to better. <laughs>